Welcome to Instigators of Change, a Coastal Adventures podcast where we take a look at innovative ideas, the people who come up with them, and those who invest in them. I'm Kara Miller, and this week, what if the way we teach people running businesses to manage those businesses is wrong? The author, former business school leader, and longtime CEO advisor, Roger Martin, worries about how we now deal with one of the most valuable assets around, talent. They want to be treated as a unique and valuable human being. They want more to be treated special than to be purely highly compensated. And I think if you looked at yourself, you'd say that about yourself, right? Roger Martin, former dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto, talks football, Aristotle, Steve Jobs, and why you've got to manage talent right to succeed. That's coming up on Instigators of Change. When you talk to Roger Martin, boldness is valued, which I discovered when I asked him about his critique of how we train business leaders. Martin has, of course, run a business school, but his writing and his speaking, they seem to indicate we're getting this whole thing wrong. We may be showing business leaders how to focus on the realities of the past instead of the possibilities of the future. That is correct. And you almost sound tentative in saying that, like it's sort of, is that sort of kind of what they're, no, that is exactly, (laughs) precisely uh, what they're taught. They are taught to optimize what is. Which is to say that Martin, the author of a slew of books, including most recently A New Way to Think, doesn't want to dance around the issue. Business schools, he says, and future leaders, they're taught to make the best of the situation in front of them and often just grind out every last penny from the current setup. And that's a problem when it comes to imagining how the world could be different. There are two big activities. If you want to be prosperous for the long time, you you have to optimize what is, because if you don't, then you're going to be inefficient and somebody will optimize better than you, right? And you need to create what does not now exist, right? And if you do those two things as a company over time, you can prosper over a long period of time rather than just come up with some nifty idea, optimize the hell out of it, and then go out of business. And the business school world grotesquely over indexes on optimizing what is and it gives only a you know passing kind of nod to creating what does not now exist that can lead to short-term cost cutting at the expense of long-term big thinking and it can lead to huge mismanagement of talent which martin says can ruin an organization It's the big thinkers, he points out, people like Steve Jobs, who aren't content to wring a few more cents out of what currently exists. They want to fundamentally reshape the future. Consider, he writes, Airbnb, which offered up a new model for vacationing. When I wrote that, I had never met uh, the co-founders of Airbnb, but I was in a little dinner in Denmark where I met uh, uh, one of them, Joe uh, Gevia, and I asked him, was there anything critically important about having gone to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, that helped him create uh, Airbnb? And the answer was music to my ears. He just simply said, well, you know, for all of his four years at RISD, he kept being given challenge after challenge of creating something that does not now exist. Hmm. And so he said that was perfect practice for doing Airbnb. And that's, in my view, what we've got to balance at business school. But we haven't been getting the balance right, Martin says, which affects the way the whole business world thinks, even folks who didn't go to business school. How do we turn things around? Well, I don't want to preempt Martin here, but suffice it to say, the solution's kind of retro. The biggest difference that I would love to see in business is to uh, go back to Aristotle the guy who created the scientific method, the first data uh, analyst, (laughs) Um, right? Because data analytics is a huge thing in the world of business now. It's kind of the coolest thing that Mm. combined with AI, machine learning, it's all data data analytics, right? That's the coolest stuff. And uh, way back when, 2,500 years ago, Aristotle (laughs) laid, laid down the foundations of that, right? He was the first human being to kind of address the question of how can we understand the causes 
of the effects that we see. And he said, well, what you do is you do, you know, kind of experiments and analyze the data to be able to say this causes that, right? Um, and, you know, then we went into the dark ages and bad things for a while and reemerged and people sort of think about the scientific method being created by Bacon, Newton, Descartes, Galileo 2,000 years later, but they were actually formalizing what Aristotle uh, said. And because the scientific revolution was important and it really kind of enhanced standards of living and, and the way we did things, it sort of took over and increasingly has taken over fields, including economics, including business, including epidemiology, a whole lot of uh, fields. But what people ignore whilst doing that is a warning that Aristotle issued 2,500 years ago. So we've adopted his method, but he warned, he said, there are two parts of the world. There's a part of the world where things cannot be other than they are, right? And that would be like, if I hold a pen in my hand and let go of it, Mm -hmm. you know, what'll happen? It'll right. drop. It right. dropped last week. It dropped a hundred years ago. It'll drop next week. It'll drop a hundred years uh, from now. It'll drop in Fort Lauderdale. It'll drop in Boston, mm -hmm. et cetera. Right. That is what Aristotle referred to as the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. And he said, in that part of the world, use my scientific method. But Aristotle also said, there's another part of the world. It's the part of the world where things can be other than they are. So the example I give is, you know, smartphones, right? How many smartphones were there in 1999? Right. You know, answer is zero. The first one was in 2000. How many are there now? 4.4 billion last time I checked. That's part of the world that can be other than it is. And you know what Aristotle said there? The inventor of science? Do not use my method there. He was not equivocal at all, right? Uh, and we've ignored his advice. What he said in that part of the world, you must imagine possibilities and choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. So what did Steve Jobs spend his entire career doing? Right? Imagining possibilities mm -hmm. and compellingly arguing for them. And what did he end up doing? Right? As he said, he dented the universe, which is interesting. It's consistent with, I don't know if he was an Aristotle fan or not, but it's consistent with Aristotle said. He said, in this part of the world where things can be other than they are, it is the job of human beings to be the cause of the effect they want to see. In the other part of the world, it's to understand the causes so you can optimize to the causes. So you can see MBA education has evolved to be for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are optimizing what is when unfortunately lots about business is in the can part of the world where things right. can be other than they they are and that's not you know aristotle was said he was very very clear on it. it's uh, the rigorous methodology there is imagining possibilities and choosing the one for which the most compelling argument can be made we don't do that in the business school world. We just don't. We say the only decisions that you make that are good decisions are ones that are based on rigorous data analysis. It's interesting, too, because I think about when the, you talk about the smartphone, I mean, there were companies that knew about touchscreens, their employees were working on them. Um, and this is before people really had touch screens. Yeah. And they were like, I don't see it. No, like th people are very happy with tiny keyboards on their phones. Let's stick with what works and what people like. Yeah, I, I agree. And and then let's optimize uh, the production costs of a, of a tiny keyboard, the radio f uh, phone that goes inside it, all those things. Yeah. And again, I'm not for a moment saying that the people who go to business school are incapable of creativity or not interested in creativity. All I'm saying is they're not taught methods for being creative. They simply are not, right? Now, at the fringe, an elective in second year, maybe we'll bring in some practitioner from the world of design uh, to teach a course, but it's a fringe activity the core activity is how to use data analytics to optimize what is. There's a bunch of areas that you write about where you think things should be different. People should look at things differently. And I want to talk about a couple of them. One is how you deal with talented 
people and what those people are looking for in a job. I, I just wonder um, if you can talk a little bit about how the thinking has evolved on talent over time, like having talented people in your organization. Is that something people gave a lot of thought to 30 years ago? How do people think about it now? That sort of thing. Sure. Well, I, I think the kind of the rise of talent as a, as if you will, an important factor of production is only kind of been recognized over the last about half century since the seventies. Like historically, if you think about the kind of the history of business, it was a battle between capital and labor, right? Mm -hmm. Who is going to get the money, right? And we, when the industrial revolution came and we needed huge scale manufacturing that required lots of capital, all these excess farm workers were moving to the cities for jobs and capital was in the catbird seat and could grind down the wages of uh, labor. Right. And then that got so bad that in 1935, the government, the U.S. government intervened and created the National Labor Relations Board, uh, National Labor Relations Act, and labor kind of battled back and was doing quite well until about 1960. And, and then capital battled back by sending jobs to first Sunbelt states, right to work states, and offshoring it and automating, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I would argue that by 1980, capital had definitively kind of beaten back labor. But what capital didn't notice is during that time, a third factor of production arose and became more powerful, and that was talent, right? Which was as distinguished from labor, where labor at the extreme, one worker is, you know, uh, fungible with another worker. With talent, there was something very special about each that made them hard to replace one for one. So in the movie business, you can have a Julia Roberts picture, uh, but if she's not willing to uh, uh, be the lead actress in it, you can still film the movie, et cetera, but it won't be a uh, Julia Roberts mm-hmm. uh, movie, right? Or same with uh, you know football, you, you know, you can have Aaron Rodgers as your quarterback, or you're going to run a different offense if you don't have him uh, as your quarterback. That became evident only in the 70s, right? And it's interesting. A bunch of things happened at the same time in the, in, in, during the 70s. That's when we had free agency in baseball in 1975 that then spread to other uh, uh, sports. That's when we had the Raiders of the Lost Ark deal that George Lucas got hmm. 50% participation in the gross profit of the movie. That's when... 2 and 20 formula for investment management became uh, popular. That's when CEO salaries accelerated. It was all in the decade of the 70s where that happened, where talent became ever more important as a productive asset. Intangible assets became more important. The building of brands, patenting of things, technical wizardry, all of those things made talent important. Right. And what arose during that period, and it really was you know, kind of CEO compensation was a big piece of it, was, well, you just have to pay to get talent, right? Talent will go to where it's paid the most. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think we've just gone overboard on that. Does talent need to be paid? Sure, right? They work, you know, talent works super hard to be that unique, skilled uh, entity that is required to do something. So you know, if you're a quarterback, you practice throwing footballs long and hard, improving your footwork, your vision, all of that kind of stuff to be to be great at, at your uh, position. So you do want to get paid. But I think that the business world has sort of missed out and stopped thinking about talent as human beings. And that's not the only thing that motivates the vast majority of, of human beings. What I think motivates human beings and is and is revealed in how talent uh, operates is that they want to be treated as a unique and valuable human being. Mm-hmm. They want more to be treated special than to be purely highly compensated. Mm-hmm. And, and I think if you looked at yourself, you'd say that about yourself, right? You want people to recognize the talent that you sure. you bring, give you opportunities to express that. If you've got ideas, you don't want their, your ideas to be dismissed and you want to be patted on the back, even though people could say, well, what does she need pats on the back? She knows she's successful. I should pat on the back other people who don't know yet that they're successful. No, talent says I worked hard to be unique 
and I want to be recognized uh, for that. So treat them special and you'll, re- you'll attract uh, and retain them, pay them a lot, and they will, they will just go to whoever uh, is the highest bidder. Let me uh, zero in on a couple of interesting cases of talent that you talked about. You've already mentioned Aaron Rodgers, but talk about why Aaron Rodgers to you is an interesting case of talent and what it is talent looks for. Sure. Well, you know, last summer, uh, essentially Aaron Rodgers and his team of, of his entire career, the Green Bay Packers had a big spat where Aaron Rodgers, who'd been their quarterback for 17 years and MVP three times, uh, Super Bowl MVP kind of, uh, once all pro many times and a loyal Green Bay Packers guy doesn't go to all the spring, uh, kind of training type activities until he, uh, he's absolutely forced to, which is a new thing for him and starts talking about the fact that he, he may retire. Uh, he may want to play with, another team and he is you know his last two previous two contracts he was paid the highest of anybody in football right so if you have this if you pay him enough talent will go wherever they want uh a philosophy that wasn't what aaron Rodgers was so mad about what was he mad about he was mad about his ideas being dismissed and he talked about it. He said, you know, I said, wow, this tight end is great in the offense. I really like him. And, and the next day he was uh, traded to Buffalo, right? Mm. He said, so I'm not going to talk about uh, those any, anymore because my guys get traded. And, and the things he wanted management to think about in terms of building the offense around him, they would just dismiss him by saying, you're a football player. We pay you to throw the ball. Uh, we make the decisions about who uh, plays around you. Hmm. You interestingly contrast this with Tom Brady, who now plays for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and he seems to have a lot of sway in terms of like the decisions they make. So like, here are two well compensated people, but their ability to have impact or feel like their ideas are valued seem very different. Yes, yes. And I think what happened uh, with Tom Brady is that I think earlier on in his career, he was just in a learning mode and and he was willing to go along with anything but toward the end of his career with the new england patriots uh I, i'm speculating some but i think his feelings uh, uh changed and um he yes you're absolutely right he had more sway uh with the tampa bay uh buccaneers went there and won a super bowl uh with them so again i don't want to say compensation doesn't matter but I think you have to have a much more sophisticated view of what attracts, retains, and motivates talent. And it's never dismiss their ideas, never block their progress, and never pass up the chance to give them a pat on the back. If you do those three things, talent will say, this is a place I want to be. I want to take what I've built over over my life and, and apply it to you, your organization, because that's the way you're treating me. Now, I'm guessing people who manage other people at football teams and otherwise are thinking, well, okay, yeah, but on any given football team, there's a lot of talented people. On any any team, there's a lot of talented people, probably. Well, they might all want different things. How do I listen to all of their ideas especially if their ideas cannot possibly align with each other and make them feel like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, going along with what they want me to do. Yeah, no, I I think it's a more complex managerial equation. Uh, So in this talent era, like it's much easier when the number one asset that you're using to be productive is cash. It doesn't talk back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's generic. A buck is a buck is a buck, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think executives got used to the fact that if they had capital behind them, they could be in charge of making all the decisions. And if all they had was capital and labor, and labor was relatively fungible, and so if somebody gets kind kind of upset and doesn't like it, you say, well, goodbye, and we'll get you another one like you. So I think it is it, we're into an era where managing is much uh, more challenging. That having been said, remember I didn't say do what they say. I say just don't dismiss them. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to have a conversation with them. And, and I think everything is pointing in the direction of talent getting ever more important. The world is awash with capital. 
right? So capital does not distinguish you uh, anymore. What is going to distinguish you as a company more and more is talent. And what's going to happen is you're going to have to make more decisions on what kind of talent you can use to build together into an organization. I want you to tell one more story of talent, but um, this is not a football player. This is an engineer, a top engineer who worked for the company WebEx. Um, his name is Eric Yuan, really like very highly valued um, at WebEx. How is that a story of mismanaged talent? Sure. Uh, so Eric Yuan, an immigrant who took forever to, you know, kept trying and trying to get, win the lottery to get uh, American citizenship, came and, and he had uh, like eight denials of like, yes. getting permit. Yeah, <laughs> which is which is great. I mean, it shows something about talent. They are not going to be blocked to at accomplishing what they want to accomplish. So he goes to, to WebEx, uh, kind of is, is the lead engineer of WebEx. WebEx gets bought by, you know, gigantic, uh, uh, Cisco and he's the lead engineer at Cisco and responsible for WebEx and goes to, uh, and this is all according to him. Uh, and that, you know, uh, Cisco may say, no, 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 this never happened. But according to Eric, he said, wow, this platform is now getting kind of dated because it's purely desktop. And there's going to be much more mobile uh, use. We've got to replatform this, you know, just rewrite the software so that it is uh, mobile friendly. And in all of its wisdom, Cisco management says, no, that's not necessary and it'd be too expensive. And that's a fatal mistake with talent, right? It's blocking their path because what he wanted to do was rewrite it for the modern uh, era. And so... Kind of what did he do? He did what talent does, which is find an environment in which he is he or she is unblocked. Mm -hmm. uh, and unblocking meant founding Zoom and crushing WebEx. I mean, crushing them. Mm. Like WebEx is just barely relevant anymore in conferencing. It's really, I think, is emerging as a two-way race between Microsoft Teams and Zoom. That's what happens when you block the path of talent. Talent will not allow its path to be blocked. And I think it's a cool story that he didn't allow the path to coming to the United States because that's where he wanted to apply his trade. Uh, you know, INS could block him, whatever it was, seven or I forget now, seven or eight times. And it was like, well, I guess I just have to try again. Uh, that's a great, in, in many respects, comprehensive story of, in this case, disastrously bad talent management. Let's go a little bit further down the chain. This kind of connects to what we were talking about at the beginning, the question of, you know, how much you pay people and what business school teaches you about that. I have seen organizations where the thinking is offer people very little money because whatever, people are replaceable, people are interchangeable. It always seemed, I have to say, quite costly to me, though, to be replacing people, um, both because there's a lot of institutional knowledge that's like lost when somebody walks out the door. But then also the people left behind who are like have very little capacity at that point to do extra work because they're they're one person down, then has to start like hiring and looking at resumes and it, there is a cost. There's for sure a cost because it doesn't take you no time and you're being paid for that time. Yes, but it's way harder to calculate. You couldn't be more correct. Uh, and uh, a wonderful professor at MIT named Zainab Tan, who has written about this in a book yes. called The Good Job Strategy. But that is a harder to calculate cost than the easy cost to say, oh, you know, if we pay people 50 cents an hour less, and, right. and we have 100,000 people, that's this amount of, uh, of money. So you're right. Companies fool themselves on that front. And Zainab in this great book just kind of shows that the companies that say, no, nope, no, nope, we're going we're, to we're gonna minimize uh, turnover by having happy, well-paid employees that we train kind of once, although, you know, ongoing, they get more training, but, you know, we, we train to be an employee kind of once and then they stay for forever because they get paid well. And it's a great environment. That's the smart uh, strategy. And it's getting smarter, I believe, every day as more and more jobs people recognize are not generic, right? Mm -hmm. There may be a generic aspect to it, but is the Costco butcher, if he decides to leave, 
yes, we can get another person called a butcher, but does he know the whole you know client base right. that comes in and right. exactly what they need? No. So more things have the attributes of talent with each passing year than before. And so those companies, I think that say, we'll minimize, uh, you know, labor costs. And if we get some churn, you know, big deal, they're just doing, <laughs> interesting enough, bad analysis, but they're analyzing the simple and ignoring analyzing the more complex. What is the cost of that, do you think, to businesses, to productivity, the sort of world you think about? I think it's huge. I mean, and, you know, Costco is the, you know, kind of got a great example of benefiting from this, while the rest of retail has, to a great extent, disposable employees, low paid, uh, precarious uh, employment. Costco's like chock a block full of people who, if you walk up to them in the store and ask them, yeah, do you like working for a Costco? And I was, yeah, absolutely. This is what they do. Da, 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 da. Uh, and you can just feel it. Or at least, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a Costco kind of. Uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of devotee. Fichonado, but <laughs> devotee. I, I mean, whenever I walk into Costco, I'm happy to shop there. And you sort of say, but isn't it like this big cinder block kind of thing with like, you know, the racks going all the way to the, it, it's not like Nordstrom's or something, but it's the people uh, in there are all happy. Right. And it's not because they're given illicit drugs. They're happy because they're paid well, treated with respect, there's promotion from within. Uh, they have exciting, interesting jobs. And Costco has won gigantically, right? And I think any company that doesn't do that is, is just leaving something huge on the table and probably going to disappear in due course as more and more companies kind of understand that there's this more complicated formula for managing, taking care of people. How, how many people have ever said to you, uh, you know, in some context, but Kara, that's business. This isn't personal. This is business. And I think that's just, <laughs> of, I, don't have, know. Have, I don't know that I've been told that a lot, but maybe a few times, a few times, but, <laughs> but just, th just think about what it means. It's sort of like for whatever I'm talking to you about, Kara, you should suspend humanity, your humanness so that you can understand my point of view here. Right. Like there are two different realms. There's like the human realm and the business realm. Right, right. But last time I checked, that business realm seems to be chock-a-block full of people, you know, customers, employees, et cetera. So how can you dis suspend humanness because you're in this realm called business? I mean, I think that's one of the great fallacies of business. No, if you, like if you uh, use human rules, like how about the golden rule, you know, I think you're going to get farther than if you use non-human rules, right? And a non-human rule is my relationship with you as an employee is how much I pay you every week. Hmm. Is that really how humans interact with other, other people? That it's just about one single criteria, one number. No, humans are complicated. They have, have, have a lot of, a lot of interests, emotions, needs, why don't you treat them like humans? How about that? And I would argue how Costco treats them absolutely as uh, as humans. And that's why Jim Senegal, the, you know, longtime CEO is not anymore. He would just be mobbed when he went into the stores, right? Hmm. Because everybody wanted to shake his hand, say hi to him, whatever, because they adored him. Why? Because he treated them as he would want to be treated himself. To take a step back, I wonder why is it that CEOs in different areas hire you a little bit like a doctor to come in and diagnose a problem, but but almost certainly about a company that they know more about than you do? Um, I think it's because most of them, if they've gotten that far, have gotten there uh, in one industry and sometimes in one company. Okay. And this is where, if you will, like kind of my model of this is different than the industry. The entire strategy advisory industry in the 90s mainly, it was by, by during the decade of the 90s, it went from being generalist in terms of industry to unbelievably specialized. So okay. you came into whatever McKinsey or BCG into their 
automotive practice or their pharma practice, and you did nothing but that for the, your entire career. What that means is that you're kind of going in and saying to the CEO of a pharma company, I kind of know more about what you should do in pharma than you do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which I've always thought, gee, you know, are the absolutely best pharma companies going to buy that service? And the answer is no, right? So what I do is I, I will only work for one company in an industry. I do not believe in working for everybody in an industry, one company per industry. So I, I don't know. I think I'm uh, advising, I lose track, 13 or 14 CEOs now, and uh, they're all in different industries. Okay. And so what I think they're interested in is what's happening in other places in the world. Mm -hmm. What do you see across that are general, general things that you could bring to bear on this specific uh, industry to add value? So I think that's the why. How much do you uh, worry that people who came up in an industry or who are immersed in it now can't see other kinds of solutions that you can see or that um, somebody come in? Do you know what I mean? Like, how much do you worry that people get bound by the sort of little box that they live in and that that's it makes it harder to push a, a business forward? Uh, for sure. Uh, and, and then that's in some sense why I do what I do. The easiest thing for me to do would be to say, I'm going to be a pharma guy or whatever guy, you know, it's, but I, I do what I do because I worry about that particular problem. The modern kind of world of business does demand some of that narrowing, right? If you want to be a CEO, you've kind of got to stick to things for long enough to work your way up the long uh, ladder to the top. Uh, and so there is, there is almost a requirement to do that. Now, again, I think the smartest CEOs are the ones who, you know, they'll belong to industry kind of groups, business roundtable or something where they rub shoulders with people in entirely different industries and mm -hmm. become friends. And, and some of them will have little groups of, of people from non-competitive industries where they'll, you know, take the opportunity to get outside of their own box. So I think you can do a lot to improve that potential structural shortcoming, or you could ignore it and just say, hey, I know everything there is to know about what to do in pharma, and I'm going to do that the best of any pharma company. And then if somebody discovers something from telecom or whatever that would be really relevant, then you, and you might end up at the back of the pack, but you don't worry about that until it happens. A final question. When you talk to business leaders, what do you feel like their biggest concerns are right now? And how have you seen that kind of change over time? Um, yeah, it, it certainly changed uh, over time. I, I think right now, DEI is uh, mm -hmm. a thing that concerns the most in a way that sustainability did 10 or 15 years ago. Like we've now, in some sense, the world and the business world as part of it have converged on standards, right? You know, if you make a ironclad pledge for carbon neutrality by X, or you sign up for the United uh, Nations science-based targets uh, kind of approach and say scope three science-based targets, we're going to commit to that by X. The business world has figured out how to respond super responsibly to that uh, crisis. I think we're 10 or 15 years behind that on DEI. I think of the executives I work for as fundamentally good-hearted people who want to do right by that, but it is not clear what a corporation should do on diversity, inclusion, equity. They know the direction they should be going, but the how and how much, et cetera, that is an, kind of an emerging, we got to figure this out challenge. So I think that's on the minds of the CEOs that I work with. Hmm. Actually, let me just quickly come back to the question I asked you at the beginning, which was sort of about companies cutting wages or, you know, like a business leader coming in and reducing wages, but not necessarily getting a lot more productivity uh, or growth out of a company. Do you think that uh, business is concerned right now about income inequality and, and maybe even as a bottom line issue for business, right? Like the more people who don't have much, the fewer customers there are for your business. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I don't even think it's even that instrumental, 
right? I, I, I think they would agree with you, but they'd say, no, it's dangerous and problematic, the, the rising in, in income inequality. You know, it would be part of a broad definition of the E in DEI. Right, right, right. right. Um, it's not the only piece of it. They're, they're distinct pieces. But no, I think there's a lot of concern. And I think it is less clear today than it was 20 or 30 years ago when 20 or 30 years ago, they would have said, if we as business in totality are doing better this year than last year, chances are the median, if you're an American company, the median American family will be doing better. Now, it is not clear that if we're all doing uh, you know, better you know, you know, uh, and the economy is expanding, uh, it may all end up in the pockets of hedge fund managers, <laughs> right? Um, and the median family may be struggling. That, I think, is now a profound worry of a lot of CEOs. Roger Martin is the former dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. He's the author, most recently, of the book, A New Way to Think. Roger, thank you so much for being here. I would do it any time, Kara. And thanks to you for listening. If you want to hear another perspective from somebody who thinks deeply about the ways in which business leaders can be better managers, check out our recent episode titled, Should You Be Radically Candid at Work?, in which we talk with Kim Scott, author of the book, Radical Candor, Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity. And of course, subscribe to the show to get new episodes every week. I'm Kara Miller. Instigators of Change is produced by Matt Purdy. We will talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.